Unfortunately, war can drive innovation. During World War II, the world's major powers set their sights on advancing technology, medicine, and communications in order to be efficient and fearsome in battle. Some of the advancements made in World War II were fundamental to modern technology others, not so much. Here is a look at some of the most bizarre, useless, and downright insane weapons developed on both sides during World War II. Neville Shute, author of On the Beach, A Town Like Alice and other popular novels, was also an aeronautical engineer who was unfortunately responsible for designing one of the silliest weapons of World War II the Great Pangenrum. Developed under the aegis of the British Admiralty's Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapons Development, it comprised a pair of 10-foot wooden wheels, the axle between them containing a two-ton drum of TNT. This ungainly device was intended to be used against the beach defenses of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. It consisted of two rocket-propelled wheels, 10 feet in diameter, joined by a cylinder filled with explosives. The Pangendrum was designed by the British Admiralty's Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapons Development and named after a piece of 18th-century nonsense prose. It would be launched from a landing craft, accelerate up the beach, and blow a hole in the sea wall or any other concrete obstacles in its path. Tests in 1943 and 1944 were a disaster. The rockets attached to the wheels often failed or detached themselves, and the pangendrum went everywhere except in a straight line. It was never used in action. Dogs played an important role in the Second World War, mainly undertaking security and search duties. In the Soviet Union they were also used for mine detection, message and supply carrying, and as weapons of war. The idea to strap explosives to a dog's back and teach it to crawl beneath a German tank was not just inhumane it wasn't very bright. During World War II the Soviets developed such dog mines which exploded when a detonating rod hit the tank's belly. Problem was the Soviets used their own T-34s to train the dogs, teaching them to seek treats beneath the tanks. T-34s had diesel engines that stank of kerosene. German tanks, however, were gasoline-fueled and smelled quite different. Amid the noise and confusion of battle, the dogs often sniffed out the familiar-smelling Soviet tanks, with predictable results. The dogs also refused to run beneath moving tanks and were often frightened off by German gunfire, only to flee back to their own trenches and foxholes, where the mines obediently detonated. The Germans quickly learned to shoot all dogs on sight. The Soviets soon abandoned this unconventional form of warfare. The Panzerkampfwagen Mose, designed by Ferdinand Porsche, was the ultimate expression of Hitler's desire to produce an indestructible super-heavy tank. It was first proposed in 1942, but few in the German high command saw the need for this 200-ton monster. Trials began in 1943, but there were constant mechanical problems associated with the drivetrain. The tracks were driven by electric motors powered by a huge Daimler-Benz aircraft engine, but top speed was barely 12 miles per hour. The Mose had armor up to 240 mm thick and a 12.8 cm gun. Although there were plans to build 150 tanks, only two prototypes two hulls and one turret were ever completed. Some have suggested the Mose was never intended for combat that it was simply a propaganda tool intended to bolster folks on the home front and terrify enemy troops who imagine facing one. None ever had to, however. By war's end the Germans had built just two prototypes Mos, one of which never got its turret and gun. White Rabbit or Nelly were two of the nicknames given to a trench-digging machine built by the Royal Navy and known officially as Cultivator No. 6. It was based on an idea first proposed by Winston Churchill during the First World War, which he revived in 1939 as First Lord of the Admiralty. Nelly was intended to burrow towards the enemy line, excavating a trench wide enough for troops to advance behind. The huge 130-ton machine combined a plow and cylindrical cutter, but carried no weapons. The device may have had some merit on the Western Front during the First World War, but was utterly unnecessary on the Second World War battlefield, and the idea was eventually dropped after a handful of machines had been constructed. Goliath, or the Leichtladungstriger, was a German expendable miniature tracked vehicle designed to deliver an explosive device by remote control. There were two types. 
battery powered with a 60 kilograms charge or a larger petrol engine version that could carry a 100 kilograms device up to 650 meters from the controller goliath was to be used against buildings bunkers or even enemy troops and vehicles if the opportunity arose some were used to clear minefields Unfortunately for the Germans, the trailing control wires were vulnerable to being cut, and the vehicle itself was slow and had poor ground clearance. 2,650 were built between April 1942 and September 1944, but were rarely effective. The Germans also experimented with larger, radio-controlled vehicles that could drop a charge close to their intended target and then retire to a safe distance, but these two were a waste of resources. While there were several so-called periscope rifles developed during World War I as a response to the conditions of trench warfare, some varied in their success. These weapons were developed by numerous sides during World War I, but they were being utilized by the end of 1914. A notable example was Beach's periscope rifle, which was invented in 1915 during the Gallipoli campaign by a British-born Australian soldier, Lance Corporal William Beach. He modified a standard Lee Enfield 300 rifle, cutting the stock in half, then connected the two halves with a board and mirror periscope. Beach then horizontally aligned the sights of the rifles, used a string to pull the trigger, allowing it to be fired from within cover. However, we are talking about failed weapons. The Krumlov curved barrel was an example that did not work so well. This bent barrel attachment for the Sturmdauer 44 assault rifle was developed by Germany in World War II. Like Beach's and others' rifles, it included a periscope sight for firing around corners. The problems with Krumlov included its large attachment, meaning the barrel and bullets came under great stress, causing bullets to shatter and exit the barrel in multiple fragments. This was more like a shotgun than a rifle. Ultimately, the weapon had a very short lifespan. The United States enjoyed a position of virtual invulnerability to air attack during the Second World War. No conventional aircraft could reach it from an Axis country. However, from November 1944 to April 1945, the Japanese attempted a bombing campaign using unmanned balloons with incendiary or high explosive devices attached. A fire balloon or Fugo was hydrogen balloon capable of carrying an anti-personnel bomb or incendiary bomb over the Pacific Ocean by using the jet stream. They were cheap to produce and were meant to be drop bombs on American and Canadian cities, forests, and farmland. The Fugo was the first ever weapon that possessed intercontinental range. At the time, the strikes on America using these devices were the longest ranges attacks that ever took place in the history of warfare. This record was not broken until Operation Black Buck in 1982, during the Falkland Islands War. Over the project, over 9,000 balloons were launched, with the Japanese expecting around 10% to reach their intended targets. There were only around 300 balloons observed in America, with the consensus being that they landed in largely unpopulated areas. The greatest threat from the balloons was starting wildfires. The only casualties were a woman and six children who died in May 1945 when they discovered a balloon device in Oregon. In 1945, the last balloon launched and the project was abandoned. The expense of the project was very large, and B-29s had destroyed two of the three hydrogen plants the project required. The Japanese military regarded death in battle as the ultimate way to serve their emperor. When the war started to turn against Japan, the use of suicide weapons became a natural extension of this ethos and a symbol of their desperation. The most famous example were the kamikaze pilots who deliberately crashed their aircraft into American ships. The Oka was a manned rocket-powered flying bomb which was carried beneath an aircraft and then released near its target. There were also Shinyo suicide motorboats and Katen manned torpedoes. Not all kamikaze weapons were small. The giant battleship Yamato was sent on a one-way mission during the Battle of the Philippines in 1944. It was sunk by U.S. aircraft. Japanese suicide attacks caused heavy casualties on occasions, but had no hope of stemming the huge American onslaught. Even some Japanese commanders opposed the tactics as wasteful and futile. A giant railway-mounted gun had been used by the Germans to bombard Paris during the First World War. The concept of such a colossal weapon was revived in 1936, when Adolf Hitler asked the head of Krupp armaments what type of gun could destroy the fortifications of the Maginot Line. The gun was designated Schwerer Gustav. 
The 80 cm gun weighed 1,350 tons and could project a 7-ton shell 29 miles. It was completed too late for the German Army's attack on France in May 1940. The artillery unit to which it was allocated in January 1942 named the gun Dora. It fired 47 rounds against the city of Sevastopol in the Soviet Union wearing out the barrel in the process. The second gun produced by Krupp, Schwerer Gustav II, was never used in action. Schwerer Gustav II was placed in storage in March 1943 at Trugenwald in artillery firing range. The increased efficacy of aerial bombardment in the Second World War made these large guns obsolete. The wind cannon was a bizarre German anti-aircraft weapon. It comprised a large barrel, bent upwards at one end, through which an explosive jet of compressed air was ejected upwards by the ignition of a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. The aim was to knock down low-flying aircraft. Trials showed that a powerful slug of high-velocity air could inflict damage on ground structures, but it was unclear if it would have the desired effect against a small, fast-moving aircraft. In 1945 a wind cannon was installed on a bridge over the River Elbe, but it failed to achieve any results.